Hello, everyone. I'm Karen Cho, co-anchor of Squawk Box Europe on CNBC. Let me please extend a warm welcome to the World Economic Forum participants, stakeholders and delegates. Thank you so much for joining us for this discussion. Well, we are about to begin a conversation on a topic that is embedded in the DNA of the World Economic Forum, stakeholder capitalism. But it is also a highly contentious one. The legitimacy of sustainability reporting has been questioned with ongoing claims about greenwashing. Can better non-financial reporting repair trust and amid fragmentation across jurisdictions? The IFRS Foundation's International Sustainability Standards Board brings promise, but what's next? Can companies forge ahead with responsible capitalism while faced with deteriorating economic conditions divided investor bases, a highly charged political environment on the issue. Feel free to engage on social channels with this conversation, hashtag WEF23, and for those on the audience, you can also participate using Slido. Let me introduce you to our panellists today. Erki Lykanen, Chair of IFRS Foundation, United Kingdom. Brian Moynihan, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, Bank of America USA, Chair of the World Economic Forum International Business Council. Geraldine Matchett, Co-Chief Executive Officer and Chief Financial Officer of Royal DSM Netherlands. And Anish Shah, Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer of Mahindra Group India. Welcome to you all and thank you so much for joining us today. Okay, let me turn to you first. It feels as though it's a race against time to keep stakeholder capitalism on track in 2023. How much progress has there been towards developing a global standard for non-financial reporting that gives investors, consumers certainty that the claims they're reading from companies about social impact, sustainability, governance are more than just marketing campaigns highlighting the good, bearing the bad, but importantly also allowing us apples for apples comparisons on company disclosures? Thank you very much. It's a very important question. Can I just first say that it actually started here three years ago. Brian was a key operator, promoter here for the demands that we must have global sustainability standards which are comparable and transparent. And then, then I was chairing the IFRS Foundation and we do financial reporting standards which are used in, 100, are used in 144 countries fully or partially. But we are careful not to go to the sustainability area unless it's a demand because there were already so many organizations there. So we organized a consultation, global consultation, with two questions. Do we need global sustainability standards? Second, should IFRS play, play, IFRS play a role there because it's global and well known? Massive yes for the first question. Majority also is a yes to this uh, uh, second question. So we started preparations and, and second turning point was in March 2021 in Glasgow COP26 summit, where we were able to make three announcements. First, we are establishing an international sustainability standards board. Where are we now? It's now established, fully operational. It's now in meeting actually in Frankfurt today. Second, we need to consolidate the, the multiplicity of the standard setting organizations in the area to avoid the, the, the uh, alphabet soup. What has happened, we were able to consolidate major organizations such as uh, SASP and IR, which were part of Value Reporting Foundation and CDSP uh, on the climate in Europe, so that since August, they are part of IFRS as a whole, which is a major simplification on the one hand, and gives us a lot of knowledge and know-how in our work. Third issue, we promised in Glasgow in March 2021 that we publish prototypes for two strand standards for gen general requirements and second for climate. It was done, consultation was organized this year, and now the sustainability standards board is working for the final form. And the aim is very concretely, they would be able to publish and adopt, issue the final standard by mid this year, which means in June. And it's, it's tremendous speed. I, I've been working with the standardization and normally two issues never meet. 
speed and standardization. But this time, because there's such an urgency, we have <laughs> Paris Agreement, we had a lot of pressure from, from the markets, from NGOs. Everybody feels that we must move forward, and we are doing it. So, okay, I feel like we need a drum roll. So there is a global standard coming in June on non-financial reporting. On two issues, on, on general requirements, which will be, as I said, the standard, a model standard, and then on climate. But of course, that's only standard. From that on, we must move forward. It must be also endorsed and adopted. And IOSCO, which international organizations for security regulators, has been working very closely with us. And I expect them to endorse them relatively soon. And third step is then to get assurance so that when companies are audited, mm. auditors are able to give assurance that they have been following the standards, that should also follow. So many things are move, moving on. Finally, and I finish here, is that because of the the global character of the issue. We must be present in all, all uh, jurisdictions. So our offices have been set so that we have one in Frankfurt, which is Europe, Montreal, and the largest agreement with, with, with Beijing. And we have earlier uh, offices which continue to work in San Francisco, uh, in, in uh, Tokyo, and London. So it's this kind of global footprint is there at the moment and it's fully functioning. Okay, thank you very much for setting the scene there, Geraldine. I want to bring you in. You're the CEO of a European company that has been leading on sustainability, impact on social governance. You're also headquartered in a jurisdiction that is demanding more paperwork from companies to avoid greenwashing concerns. What is the biggest hurdle that you <coughs> think you are facing in accelerating this idea of stakeholder capitalism in 2023? I can't agree more with you. The big dilemma, as you were saying earlier, is speed versus standardization. So firstly, I would like to applaud, and thank you very much, Brian, for helping get speed on getting convergence. Now, as Royal DSM, we have been uh, basically reporting on non-financial uh, KPIs for 20 years plus. We're a triple P bottom line company, people, planet, profit. We've put that in our incentives. It's been audited. It goes to the audit committee. <coughs> it's part of the same way of communicating with our customers, with our stakeholders, with our employees. So this goes a long way. However, and I think it's worth reminding the audience who are listening to us, why is it so important that we're seeking convergence at speed? And that is because the topics that we are trying to address with this broader definition of capitalism is that a company is effectively part of the economy and of society. We are just people trying to meet the needs and demands and the activities we do have also broader implications. How do we in an efficient way make sure that we communicate on this as much as the financial part? Now, you said, where, where is the, the barrier? So I think the direction of travel is going well, the speed is going well. The, the hardest thing right now is actually finding the right pace. And it's probably the first time in my career, and I've been a very much an advocate for this, that I worry a little bit about speed, because speed without convergence is not going to work. And what we're seeing is there's a lot of work being done now very well. We have the, you know, the, 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 the international sustainability standards coming. We have the European Union putting a lot of efforts. There's a lot of demand in terms of disclosures coming from there. And we have the US jurisdiction. If we do not have alignment, this will not actually meet the aim of what everyone is seeking, which is better transparency and importantly, more trust in the numbers. So for me, the biggest barrier is finding that right balance between speed and convergence and the other big challenge, actually having the people who can do this. So there's a huge lack of talent, of qualified uh, individuals who can join companies to help the preparers like us to, to, to provide more and more of that disclosure, but also in the, actually the audit firms are struggling to have enough resources. So, you know, I think the, the ambition is, is definitely the right one. Finding that right pace is, is actually critical. Geraldine, thank you. Brian, you've been a leading voice in stakeholder capitalism for various different roles as chair of WEF's International Business Council, a member of the Vatican Council for Inclusive Capitalism, and co-chair of the Sustainable Markets Initiative launched by Prince uh, King Charles, I should say now. Critics believe companies have been too active in controlling the narrative, though, with voluntary disclosures. Does stakeholder capitalism need a reboot in 2023, and would common standards achieve that? Well, I think... Uh my two colleagues have sort of laid it out that what we saw back uh, five years ago when we sort of started on this 
was as we talked about things about you know sort of short termism and thinking about companies over long periods of times. As we thought about you know 50 plus years ago when Klaus sort of wrote the manifesto on stakeholder capitalism. As we thought about the companies, I think 400 or so was signed for, uh, to support the SDGs in 2017. You started saying, wait a second, we've got a lot of different people defining what all this means, and we've never sort of defined. Here's the metrics by which to measure the progress of the private sector and stakeholder capitalism. And without that definition, without that convergence and all the things that my colleagues have talked about, what you had is everybody define it their own way. And somebody would think this issue is important or this way to talk about this issue. And what hit me is I was sitting in Argentina at the G20, whatever year that was, and I'm sitting there on a panel and I look out at, at the audience and everybody there wanted to tell me different ways to calculate the same question. I said, this, this has got to do it. And I looked and there were 600 conferences mm -hmm. on metrics on sustainability scheduled in 2020 in North America alone. And I said, we've got to, business has got to take a leadership position here. So we, we went and said to the big four accounting firms, go out and look at all the metrics, including GRR and SASB and all the people, get them in a room, put them in a room, work with those colleagues, and try to come up with a set of metrics that match the SDGs that simply says capitalism is aligned to producing what the world wants from us, simply says company X, Y, or Z across all industries and all types of companies is aligned. It, with driving that, and we'll tell you how they're doing it. And then the last part's critical, put it in your annual report. So now we have 200 companies round numbers are doing this, 50-odd uh, are on their third year this year, uh, uh, another 60, 70 are on their second year this year, and another 80 or so are coming on stream. And these are all industries across all the world. So what you can say, people can say is now it's in your annual report, Sarbanes-Oxley in the U.S. context is going into it. It's accountable. It's disclose or tell people why you can't disclose this. They cover all the metrics, there's 20 out of them. And then we started saying, okay, now we gotta go to the official side and, and try to get them to adopt it. And that's where Ricky and the, the colleagues, and we said, you know, we don't want this to be unofficial. We want it to be official. So then we can say, stop the unofficial level of it, and we all agree. And then, frankly, an investment manager, a consumer, society, others can sit there and say, here's a line which is acceptable, and you're either above it or below. If you're below it, we shouldn't do business with you. And if you're above it, Tell us how you're making progress along these important things, which in the end of the day will align capitalism and what society wants from it, and then we'll get us going faster. Brian, thank you. Nisha, I want to turn to you, an important voice too, because emerging markets need to be part of the conversation on stakeholder capitalism. If we think about India, it's been late to the party, but it is now driving forward too in trying to achieve responsible capitalism. For instance, the securities regulator has made it mandatory for top 100, 1,000 listed companies to reveal sustainability information and the country has a specific CSR mandate to spend 2% of profits on CSR initiatives. Can India catch up on stakeholder capitalism? So Karen, India has often leapfrogged in many areas and uh, this is one as well where the momentum we are seeing right now will allow India to leapfrog again. Our Prime Minister has put out a very high bar to get to 50% renewable energy by 2030. As we think about energy transition, that is a huge step forward. Solar energy in India today is cheaper than coal. It's at 2.7 cents per kilowatt hour. We have a solar business as part of our group, and uh, the kind of momentum we are seeing in solar is just amazing. Uh, so. I do feel that India will end up leapfrogging, but I go back to the conversation here, which is critical around having the metrics. And again, I would commend uh, Brian for his work with the IBC. We are one of the 200 companies that are reporting. It's audited, it's in an annual report. Uh, but I'd go beyond that, which is, what are the actions now that we are driving? Uh, we often talk about goals for 2040 and 2050. Uh, we want to start talking about goals for 24 and 25 and really start driving those actions. Uh, so we've got the reporting and measurement behind us. We've really got to start focusing on the action now. Let's circle back to the standards then, so and Erki. Yes. So, so we have a business in it. We've got to be careful about CSR in the 2% spending, which is, which is a great policy for that country. And you know, we, we do it just like Mendu does it and others. Away from that to alignment of the entire enterprise. And that changes this dynamic dramatic. Would you rather have 2% of our profits in India, or would you rather have our entire $60 billion uh, cost base aligned, or $3 trillion uh, balance sheet aligned, or 3 or $4 trillion in assets that we hold for our customers? That's the distinction we're making in this, is aligning the entire enterprise, mm -hmm. which will create a lot more action, how we purchase, how we consume energy, how we hire, how we uh, promote. 
away from the classic sort of philanthropically broadened into corporate governance, that is, that's 70s and 80s, honestly. We are now in a different world, which is you have to align the entire system to get the progress society wants. Come back in on this. I would agree completely with Brian, because this has to be driven from within. It is not a mandate saying you got to spend 2% here and therefore we would do that. Uh, if I go back to the Mahindra Group's history, we are a 77-year-old group, and uh, we've been spending more on CSR since our inception uh, without any mandates at that point in time. We started our sustainability journey in 2008. Uh, we've had India's first carbon neutral plant. We are looking at, uh, in fact, we've set up India's first residential net zero community. So there are a number of actions around greening ourselves, decarbonizing industries, nurturing the planet. But all of that happens only when exactly as Brian said, everyone's aligned within the company and that we want to do it because it's right for uh, what's required for the world. Let's talk about that convergence then. I, I wanted to just take us back to this global standard. We've got more than 140 countries that follow global accounting rules so we can compare profits mostly yeah. across the globe. But even with a common standard, how hard will it be to get buy-in because of all the different voluntary mandatory rules we've got at this point? Perhaps, perhaps we must remember that the, the Paris Agreement has broad support politically. Then the Financial Stability Board, which was shared by Mark Carney, accepted the TSCD recommendations, which have also been broadly accepted. And their structure is in our standards. And now the consultation on the content has been also broadly agreed because it's based on this long work. Mm -hmm. So I'm relatively optimistic that we can accept this kind of global baseline everywhere and why it is important even though of course everything is important what companies do inside but investors need to be able to compare if there's no global baseline you are not able to compare your investment then there are jurisdictions who want to go higher as was said here but it's very important that they are somehow clear they are complementary that this global baseline applies for all and we are working very hard for that in good cooperation also with jurisdictions there's a particular the traditional working group where we have, for instance, SEC, European Commission, Asian authorities, try to make it match show that global baseline for all and additional element, what they so want, clearly separate. Mm -hmm. One of the problems is supply chain, and a lot of companies are revisiting that value chain. How do you bring small and medium-sized enterprises into a global standard? That, that, if I just make briefly, that, that, that is very important, because if it's complicated, where you need more audit, uh, well, well, you know, accountants than work at the company, it will never work. It must be as simple as possible, standardized, and also, also done in a way that you can use also estimates. But we are very much focusing on the issue that it must be a simple formula so that whole suppliers, say, can apply the same disclosure requirements. But, but that's why you had to go away from informal standard settings and other things too, to make it part of the official sort of accounting practice in the broadest context. Because once you do that, then everybody has subject to it. If you stop with listed companies, you're only going to talk about companies. If you stop with large listed companies, you're only going to talk about certain companies. And so what can happen is you can have squeezing out of things that may want to go on by other companies and the claims of, wait, this is an unlevel playing field or there's greenwashing because people are just divesting, including assets, and nothing's being done to reduce emissions, which is the whole game. And I'm looking at Al and uh, Al Gore there, and they, they, he'll tell us at some point, stop all this dialogue, it's about that, and we got it. Um, but, you know, you, but the thing is, if you let it squeeze out of the system, you, you can do that. All these informal standards, when all these groups that you see, this alphabet soup, as Eric talked about, they come to big companies like, they're not talking to the supply chain down the stream. So net zero commitment by a big company will drive the supply chain. But if they don't have to disclose it, they can hide for a while or the private equity firms can take those out of the public domain. Or, and this, this doesn't let you do that. And that's the, as we, the big four accounting firms have been spectacular in their support and help develop this. Have we tried to educate clients? They have tried to educate the clients. They said, if it goes through the process which it is going through, it becomes part of the official literature as opposed to someone's idea that they can go around and do shareholder resolutions for large companies and try to create action. It's a completely different question. So I'd love to also here bring the voice of the customer and the consumer, because what has changed fundamentally is that climate targets are relevant to products and to consumption and to choices. And what we're trying to do is, and I'm clearly I've been interfacing with the capital markets my whole career, so I understand capital allocation and comparability. But what's very important is we have more and more of our customers who are saying we need to be able to tell our consumers 
what is the climate footprint of this product? And that means that you're embedding it in your absolute operations, and that requires the whole supply chain to be there. So scope three is the biggest challenge, without doubt. Scope one and two is within your own remit. You can measure it. Yes, the standards need to be the same, etc. But what is, I think, in, in many ways very uh, encouraging is that the debate about disclosures and methodologies is going well beyond annual reports, integrated reports, and capital allocation. It's in the core of what companies are doing today. And, and that makes it, to some extent, even more important that we get it right. Anish, far away from the mountain atmosphere here in Davos, are those small and medium-sized companies that you work with in India capable of adopting a global standard this year? Uh, some of them are, but that's where we need to help them. And as large companies, many of us who've been at the forefront of this have learned a lot over the last 10, 15 years that we've been doing this. And one of the discussions we had at the IBC yesterday was how do we distill that together? And how do we take that to small and medium enterprises? Uh, specifically for India, we have an alliance of uh, India CEOs for climate change. And uh, I'm co-chairing that. We had a session yesterday. And we were talking about bringing the industry associations in India together, going to the medium and small enterprises, <coughs> and helping them through our journey to say, here are things that work. Here are things that have had a six-month payback period. And we've done 2,000 projects. Uh, so we know which ones can pay back very quickly and which ones will take a little longer. And uh, it's an economic argument as well. So I would agree with Geraldine, which is first, the consumer wants it. Second, there is an economic argument. And third, if we can create a blueprint that makes it easy for folks to do it, uh, that's really the path to go forward. Brian, I want to get a little bit picky around the standards here because we know there's certainly going to be a number of critics when Oki fleshes out this global standard. If we think about accounting standards, the US uses GAAP, not IFRS, for accounting standards. So a rules-based system versus a principles-based system of IFRS. So without getting too technical here, if we don't have identical accounting yeah. standards, why should we hold out any hope that the US too will be part of a global system on non-financial reporting? You know, uh, the difference between GAAP and international accounting, there are differences, but it's, it's, uh, it's, the, it's the frosting on a layer of the cake. It, there's it's so much, you know, so much standard. And by the way, they're understood the differences. And so therefore people can articulate and see them. So, and, and that's history and how we got here and, you know. There, but there's no all, room for those differences yeah. in non-financial reporting. It, it, yeah. But the thing is, when you get to, actually, some of this, not all of it, but some of this may be easier to actually go across jurisdiction because the discussion about, <clears throat> you know, companies' energy usage and the, and the emissions part of that and things like that, there are factors and formulas and calculations that are, that are, that are already being used across jurisdiction. Um, so I, 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 call me optimistic, I, I don't think this is as hard, frankly, as, you know, accounting for inventory or something like that, trying to get that straight across 150 countries. I, I think it's, this is probably easier because it was developed as a global standard because this is a global question from the start. Becky? I, I think you are right. And even though I must say when you go up the US GAAP and IFRS, in the end, the differences are not big ones. And we work together. Yeah. We work together to avoid any yeah. disruption. But here, here, I think the critical, critical question here really is that we must have one global which we apply in the same right. way. Otherwise, it doesn't serve capital markets, it doesn't serve consumers. And that's important that Asia is here with us. I just say, and Africa. I've been very much encouraged that African, by the way, ministers of finance, ministers of the environment came out to say that we want to be among the first who adopt these global standards. Of course, for political reasons, but also reasons they want to be part of the supply chain. Simple, clear, global is, is the best solution. The second issue will then be, will they be mandatory or voluntary in the countries? Mm -hmm. But if you have the same assurance mm -hmm. for companies, the difference is not perhaps that big. Some areas may be the, uh, difficult just to make it mandatory, others make it simpler. <coughs> but you, Brian, is better expert on that area. Well, actually, the, the one thing, remember, that one of the problems going on in the U.S. is it's not going through the accounting side. Yeah. It's actually going through the securities disclosure side, yeah. which means it only applies to a very narrow set of the market. I mean, much as everybody thinks it applies a big set, every non-public company has nothing to do with this. And, and so that's the danger of going through the Securities Exchange Commission equivalent as opposed to getting a part of literature. That then stops the leakage, especially around the environment. That stops the ability to take something out of the public domain and hide it. And so, so I think it, it, so it, that's where we're trying to get to standardization at the core disclosure accounting, mm -hmm. the audit, annual report, put it in your annual report, get the audit processes on top of that. And that, 
to, to Erky's earlier point, it requires it to be somewhat straightforward at the beginning. It's never simple. Otherwise, you have the problem, we're not going to have enough people to do it, and the arguments can be about this is hard, and you're going to start to lose enthusiasm for it. So. Can I just bring up leadership here? Because this whole concept of divulging information on sustainability, human capital, governance, has been about providing a 360 on risk that is just not encapsulated in financial reporting. Yet the most prominent central banker in the world, recently on a panel, Jerome Powell over at the Fed, said last week in Stockholm that the Federal Reserve will not become a climate policy maker. Isn't that exactly what Jay Powell should be doing? I was actually in Stockholm. I know Jay well, uh, he said that there, but I just wanted to make a difference. He said that it's, it's not policy maker. Uh, Federal Reserve is not policy maker. On the other hand, financial stability belongs to the central banks. So disclosure of the risks is critical also for central banks, but you should separate these two issues. And when we talk about disclosure, it's critical to be able to m make the assessment of the risks which bank and the economy are, are facing. Brian, we know it's a very... Well, meanwhile, just so you know, if you read the papers today, they're starting their process on risk assessment yes. and climate in the big banks. So it, it, he's making a distinction, that, or he, which is policy versus uh, supervisory and, and, and analysis of the actual risks involved. It, it, that, what he's saying is I'm not the policymaker to decide who, which industries, and that, that's somebody else's job. But, but they are looking at, the, literally, we're going through the exercise beginning as we speak. Does this go to the heart of the backdrop in the United States that everyone's dancing around the politics now? There's been pushback from some US Republicans about whether companies should even be in the business of stakeholder capitalism. They should be purely focused on profits. And we're coming up to a 2024 presidential election campaign. Could the politics derail the conversation we're having here? No, because our companies have been around for almost 240 years. So we were there in the election where they actually really had a tough election in 1800, the, the, the plays are made about. So go see Hamilton, you'll see when people shot each other after elections and <laughs> the vice president brought up his treason and things like that. It's, you know, these institutions, these great institutions we all sit behind, it will be here through governments and changes. So the, the idea is you have to have something that works for society. And so the politics will ebb and flow and, and there'll be a lot of debate about it. But I think if you talk to business people, investors, and others in the United States, they're going to run the companies based on a view of, of how to create long-term value. And I, I don't think that gets derailed by politics. Geraldine, I want to turn to you because as we talk about Europe, it's a slightly different environment here. Regulators mostly on the same page. Central banks want to get involved too when it comes to stakeholder capitalism. But the problem is the investor base. I mean, Danone, a very big company in, in Europe, you had activists trying to remove the CEO in recent years because they thought he was too committed to some of these issues. Fast forward, and now you've got concerns that uh, you've got uh, legal cases coming, that activists are concerned the company hasn't been too active enough on some issues around plastics. You've got very divided communities. How do you deal with that very split opinion from what investors want from you? Ultimately, you have to go back to the essential of who you are as a company and do what's good for your company and for your employees and your customers and society at large. And you're going to have cases where sometimes it's seen as too much of, not enough. But what you were saying very earlier, you know, there's ebbs and flows. But it's all about resilience. It's about how do you, as a company and as society, manage to shocks. And we've been focusing a lot on this panel on climate standards because that's the one that is now. But what is important, this is in the context of broader non-financial reporting. And the broader part is the social part, is the, the interactions between the economy and the social dynamics. Um, so this is something we have to be careful of because I'm a little less positive on the convergence when it comes, I'm very positive on, I think we will get convergence quite rapidly on climate uh, because of the work done on TCFD, et cetera. I'm not so sure we're gonna get convergence on the broader non-financial. And to your point of Europe maybe versus the US, um, there's a big debate about single materiality versus double materiality. That is a core fundamental principle that if we can't agree on, we're going to have issues, especially if you're a multinational that works across jurisdictions. And, and when you have those fundamental differences, then it does become more complicated with the investor base uh, because you're, you're playing on different kinds of rules and expectations uh, as to you know, the emphasis that needs to be put not only on environmental but on social aspects uh, of the 
the impact of a company. Anish, I'm curious to hear your view on this as you listen to the conversation around how central banks deal with the issue and the split investor bases, politics rising around some of the, the pop populist themes. How does India deal with these competing themes as it tries to play catch up? I think let's go back to the fundamentals. This is not about politics, this is about society. And for society, capitalism is a word that often has been derided. So we have to look at how do we reinvent capitalism and really bring back the positives of capitalism in terms of helping society. Uh, for us, that's close to our heart. Our philosophy is what we call RISE, which is enabling communities to rise or driving positive change in lives of communities. Uh, we have been very clear that we are purpose-driven. Purpose comes first, profits follow. And that's something we've told our investors for many years. Uh, we are the best performing stock in the Nifty for the last 20 years. And therefore, our investors like the fact that we are purpose driven. Yes, obviously, they want to see profits as well, but uh, purpose will always come first. So I don't think there's a choice in that factor. Um, so while there will be noise around it, uh, I think if companies stay true to their course, consumers will see that. We talked about trust and transparency earlier. That's a very important element for companies to succeed. And with that, Investors, politicians, all, I think, will follow the same tune. I think in a strong economic environment, it's easy for companies to say that purpose comes first. But what about uh, a very difficult economic environment now that we're setting up for, that companies are worried about profits, they're worried about margins for the first time in a number of years. We're coming off the back of what uh, have been extraordinary conditions for company profits. <coughs> How do we think about things like human capital, a commitment to bringing social impact when, quite frankly, companies are, are laying off workers? How do we stay on track on some of these issues? I, th I think <coughs> we call it the genius of the end. It's profits and purpose. And that's not a concept that we minted. It's a great business writer, Jim Collins, in the mid-90s talked about the sustainability of companies, all the companies studied, and you know, how the great fail, and all, this, all the different books he's written. That was one of the key principles. And so I think it's always going to ebb and flow and be in balance. But, it, but it, you know, in tough times, it, you know, after the financial crisis, we still drove the company down both avenues. And so yeah, when you think about adjustments in the headcount, our job is to manage it without having human. You can reduce jobs without actually having human impact by letting attrition be your friend and managing through that stuff. And it, so that's why we plan a headcount by months, three years in advance to sit there and say, how do we manage and how do we retrain people and how do we bring people across? And uh, Brian, but that's your company. You've just come off the back of a very strong reporting yeah. season. Not every company is in the same position. I think, you know, I think there are we have the luxury that we're big, uh, more diverse. We move people around and stuff. But, you know, I think the managers I talk to think hard about this. It's, it, you know, d disrupting somebody's life is one of the most difficult things that you can do as a manager. And so I think, you know, all of us try to figure out a way around it. But, but be that as it may, it, you know, go to the other side, and this goes out to a little bit Geraldine's point. The metrics we had are balanced across different dimensions. So they go against all the SDGs. They go against people, profit, purpose, and planet. And so, you know, they get into the, the international tax stuff. They get into diversity disclosure. They get into um, other aspects of the company's operations, not just environmental. We all talk about environmental because it's so critically important, but the reality is it goes across this balanced uh, view, which ought to really be a measurement across time of all your constituencies constituency, constituency being met. And that, that's an important aspect of this. And so, um, so I think we got to make sure that we don't just do the environmental stop. You want to go across these things, which the human capital question becomes that turnover rates, just, uh, diversity, uh, uh, fair treatment, supply chain work, you know, things like that that are imp critically important here. Yes, I, actually, the, the work program is such that this year we should get done this general requirements uh, standard and climate. And from that on, there will be agenda consultation on four issues. First would be biodiversity, second, human capital, third, human rights, and fourth, connectivity with, with financial reporting. And this will be consulted globally and openly. So we are moving on, but I just think that for the credibility of the exercise, this climate standard is critical. Yeah, There's such a support behind, if we can't fix the follow the timetable, get it done, credibility for the other exercises will also be weaker. Second point on the short-termism, and of course, I mean, 
In politics and business, there are people who only work on short term. They don't live long. <laughs> You've come from a world of, of central banking, though, Eki. You've seen rational decisions. I mean, you think about not just from the human capital point of view around climate change, that some companies may not want to invest as much now. They can still hit the long-term target, 2030, 2040, 2050. They don't have to commit the investment. In the next 24 months, they can change the time frame. Of course, of course, the atmosphere is difficult. But let's say in Europe, we have when Ukraine has a lot of, you know, disruptions and surprises. But still, I, I, I'm, I'm saying in Europe, if I make one comment on Europe, is that I, I must respect the European political leadership. In European Union, you saw yesterday Unzo van der Leyen here, you have seen many prime ministers. They have been working for the long term. They don't give in. They have been united. And I think this same attitude works with the Green Deal, works with the global sustainability standards. They have been setbacks, but keep the long term in your mind. You can adjust, but don't change the course. Direction travel must be clear. And what I have seen now, leaders, you'll see many others, is perhaps stronger common position we have seen for a long time in Europe. Geraldine, I'm interested to hear your views as to whether you think there will be slippage on some of the goals this year, given the tough macroeconomic environment. Do you think some companies will pull back on these targets around social, around climate targets, investments in particular? Well, maybe just if you allow me to bounce back on the long-term targets versus the short-term, and that's probably where the biggest credibility gap or potential gap comes from is people say, yeah, fine, you put targets to 20, 30, 50, but you, the person, won't necessarily be in the job anymore. And one way of addressing that is to actually combine these externally committed targets midterm with internal targets that are actually preferably linked to incentives. And those are either annual bonus or long-term incentives, long-term being usually three years, LTI type of structures. And then you have basically you're embedding the micro steps in the context of a committed long-term direction. And why is that helpful? And that's our genuine experience is that you have to take into account the context. We're currently in a very difficult economic environment. Um, in Europe, of <coughs> course, we have the impact of Ukraine and things like that. So you, you can adjust in your, your short-term planning you have all of those little bumpiness that comes along, but it is anchored in a long-term direction, which, by the way, governance then kicks in with the board making sure that you, you are constantly driving those roadmaps. So I would say that is how, in practice, companies do this. Is it's Externally, it looks like a long-term ambition, but internally, you set your roadmaps and you set your hurdles and you take it forward. What we're going to see in 2023 is exactly that. Is, is the environment an easy one to navigate? Absolutely not. But when you know what your mid to long term ambition is and you're setting every year, it's like you're rolling forecast. It's a, you, you say, OK, we have different facts. We adjust to them, but we know what the goal is. And, and when you are in a, in a space where you are able to, as a corporation to do this, you attract the right kind of people who are going to make it happen as well. Anish, let me toss it down to you as we talk about just navigating this tightrope of the macroeconomic headwinds this year. Do you think that some companies will just take a shortcut and pull back from some of these targets we're talking about? So, Karen, purpose is more important in tough times. When times are good, it's easy to do everything else. So the true test is if you're building long-term trust, then can you stand up and live your purpose in tough times as well? And uh, I do see us and a number of companies around us actually being able to do that because this is not about 2040 and 2050. I agree with Geraldine, which is it's easy to set those targets. We won't be here. It's someone else's problem at that point. But we have to set targets for 24 and 25 and 26. And those are the targets that we have to drive. Let me, let, just two things there. One is this, if this annualized disclosure has to show year by year progress. Mm -hmm. And so having now done this a couple of years and having talked to people come and say, you know, how, you know we'd, like to, we'd like to know how you're doing diversity. So we'll go to page 53 or whatever it is in the annual report. You can see it and you see it across time. So, you know, you, it now binds the company because the next year it's got to drop in. If it disappeared, it'd be really strange, right? So there's a scope one, scope two, uh, scope three, the controllable, and then moving out what you're doing. You, know, you pick the topic. So one is this, by having it disclosed on a, on a periodic basis, you actually, in making part of the official, uh, record, so to speak, you, you can't walk away from it. And second is, just the facts don't bear out 
it, it has not been, uh, you know, 20 and 21 and 22 were three interesting years, right? And the reality is, you know, I think in 21 we did $200 billion of financing around the SDGs, about three quarters of that was environmental. And it, in 22, uh, we haven't told it all up yet, but it's gonna be bigger. And so, well, the world's been going, the commitments are net zero by operating companies and colleges and everybody, 8,000 organizations, if not, I remember Nigel's numbers right, but you know, it creates this level of activity that just is, is growing very fast. That's not gonna stop because those projects are committed to and going on, you know, with 20 branches of solar on top of the US, we have 60 this year, you know, these things are relentless in the thing. Could you slow them down? Sure but they won't stop. And so our client demand is driving this and you see it keep going up. So obviously it hasn't been stopped in very tough times for the world in the last couple of years. A war, a, a pandemic, shutting down the economy, uh, interest rate movements down and up. You know, you pick your spot and the uncertainty around that. And yet the amount of financing going towards these things has gone up each year. We've got a couple of minutes left for a very quick comment from each of you on a concrete step that CEOs, leaders of companies, institutions can take this year, something that perhaps can be replicated to make genuine progress in 2023. Anish, do you want to kick it off for us? I would start with decarbonizing our industries. That's one way we've got to take the leadership, and it's possible. And what we are seeing also is consumers actually want it. I talked about a residential net zero project. It sold out in three days. We haven't seen that with any of our other projects. So consumers want to come in and align themselves with green. And uh, that's a momentum shift that we are seeing, which is very significant. So in terms of concrete, concrete steps, we have to focus on decarbonizing our industries, look at circularity wherever possible, and work with not only our suppliers, but also everyone else in the industry to be able to have that path, to be able to share what works. Uh, this is innovation, but it's not innovation for a specific company. It has to be done collaboratively. OK, do you want to weigh in here? Perhaps I take a one step forward, Jean-Paul Gervais, who is the chair of the IOSCO, which is the International Organization of, of uh, Securities Regulators, he said that the aim should be that 2024 financial reporting and sustainable reporting will go together. I think that's, that's a good point to keep in mind. If you are a business leader, be ready to report both 2024. The questions cannot be any more delicate to sustain the director. They will come to CEO. If you take that as a target, move forward when standards are there, start to apply, be ready. Geraldine, what concrete step can other CEOs take this year? Yeah, for me, in the context of the conversation we're having on this panel, is absolutely be engaged right here, right now, on making real the convergence of these standards that are coming. Um, because if we're not avoid, we cannot complain later if we don't like the way that things have fallen. So this alignment, particularly, I have to say, a bit self-interested between Europe and the US, uh, because this is starting, it will be the bedrock from which the international baseline is gonna be based. Um, we need to be all at the table in order not to slow things down, but to make sure that the quality of what comes at the end has built the trust. Uh, and 2023 is the year. Yeah. Brian. Two, two parts to it. One is, and I said it to the IBC members, and mm. you know, we've got 200 companies, and if you're not one of them, why aren't you joining? Because you're, you're going you're to be a competitor to look like one of those companies. So get the disclosure done because, frankly, Rick, you said it's true. It's coming at you anyway, so you might as well get going. And that, that's sort of a concrete step a CEO can drive in their company. The second thing, uh, as, a, as a financial services company, as a bank, and you know, the thing we're doing a lot of, especially in the supply chain question, is, we're, we've had 12,000 meetings with customers so far, small, minimum-sized business, explain what a net zero commitment by their ultimate buyer of their product means. And that education process is helping them get prepared for what's gonna come down the pike at them at some point, maybe not yet. And to me, that's a very concrete step because in the, the day, the belief that the financial system is gonna drive this is dead flat wrong. It has to be the actual operating companies and then we'll help that finance that transition. One of the things you have to do is educate the people who don't have the hundreds of people we have work on this stuff about what it's going to mean to them. And as you do that, you're going to start the momentum for another round of activity. And that's a concrete step. What's going on as we speak? 
There's been plenty, I think, of uh, topic ideas that we've covered here in stakeholder capitalism, from the convergence that needs to take place across jurisdictions, the common standard that is coming and how you prepare for that from everything from a small and medium-sized enterprise, an emerging developing market, to a very large multinational globally. Thank you very much for tackling the issues, the challenges, and of course, one of the big ones and the backdrop for many people here on the mountain is that macroeconomic and how you stay on track with many of those long-term targets. Very much appreciate the time here on stage. Thank you very much to Geraldine, to Brian, to Anish, and also to Erki. We do appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you very much.